we have the distinct honor of some very special guests here because our president is speaking tonight. But we have the privilege of having with us a representative from the Archdiocese of uh, San Antonio who happens to be a friend, uh, a brother priest, and whose father has been very successful and has taught at our law school for many, many years. Uh, Father Martin Leopold will be leading us in an opening prayer. He is presently administrator of Our Lady of the Grace, uh, of Our Lady of Grace Parish here in San Antonio, and moderator of the Curia. Uh, he has been doing marvelous, marvelous work. Uh, and so let's welcome uh, Father Leopold back to St. Mary's. As we, as we gather, maybe we pray asking the Holy Spirit uh, to guide us this evening, our, our President, in his words and us in our listening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O Lord, God, through the light of your Holy Spirit, you bring us consolation and peace. Help us to know and follow your path. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our 13th president of St. Mary's University to you. As I mentioned in the communication that I sent out earlier uh, in the week, uh, he's no stranger to the issue that he'll be addressing uh, in the context of the Catholic intellectual tradition. Uh, previously, he was a successful dean at the University of St. Thomas School of Law in Minneapolis, where he held the Ryan Chair. Prior to that, he worked at the University of Illinois, where he was dean of the College of Law as well as the interim provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs. He has been extremely successful. He is well known and respected by colleagues. In both of those institutions, he served on university-wide leadership councils and committees, including those for dean searches, university-wide mission statement development, and budget strategies and academic best practices that he fostered at these institutions. And now he's our 13th president, and he continues to shine as he does that here for us at St. Mary's University. Uh, just a very uh, brief personal note uh, is that uh, he also has a background in philosophy Last year, when I approached him, uh, if he would be willing, he said, sure, right away. And I can tell you in all sincerity that he has been working diligently, long and hard, uh, to really present the material and present it well. So let's welcome our president to the podium. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, Father Rudy, and thank you all for coming. The title of this year's series of four lectures on Catholic intellectual tradition is The Enterprise of Faith, a Bold Initiative. And following the series name, I've titled my talk The Catholic University as Faithful Enterprise. <coughs> Associating the phrase enterprise with faith and faithful may seem odd or inappropriate, even shocking. For many, the word enterprise has a gigantic IBM, big blue, uh, big corporate kind of feel to it. Not to suggest that there's anything wrong with IBM, but some of you may be thinking, Mengler, you might as well have titled your talk, St. Mary's University and Global Domination. <laughs> Indeed, one of the dictionary definitions of enterprise is a, quote, large business organization. Enterprise can also have a more sinister meaning. An enterprise can be a fraudulent scheme or illegitimate enterprise. That's in fact the 
the meaning I first attributed to it. To tell this story, I need to take you back to my childhood in the 50s and 60s. I grew up in two suburbs just west of the city of Chicago. The Chicago neighborhood where I grew up, grew up was kind of almost the American dream come true. A Melwood Park and River Forest were teeming with immigrants and their children and grandchildren. Our parents or grandparents had immigrated to the United States from Italy or Ireland or, or Poland or the Czech Republic. I was surrounded by sort of working class, hard working, good and honest people. Everybody, everybody was Catholic. I mean everybody. I never had a non-Catholic friend. You're probably going to be shocked. I never had a non-Catholic friend until I went to college. All the parents were still married to each other and they all had a lot of kids. The Conways who lived just down the block from us, for example, had 17 children. <laughs> Mrs. Conway always projected a serene glow. <laughs> Mr. Conway's glow suggested he was about to spontaneously combust. <laughs> lots of people, lots of kids in the neighborhood, all except one household, which was just two doors down from the Menglers. An elderly woman, Marge Inciso, she was probably younger than I, you know, I was 10 then, she probably was 45. An elderly woman <laughs> lived at 1520 Lathrop Avenue uh, by herself. When I was 10 years old in 1963, I overheard my parents whispering. They must have believed outside my hearing that Mr. Inciso was in the slammer. He was in jail for income tax evasion. Now that's kind of an interesting image, isn't it? Why were my parents whispering? What were they worried about? That I was going to have nightmares? Dreaming about Mr. Inciso? He was in jail after all. For income tax evasion, not for doing grievous bodily harm. Well actually that wasn't true. Mr. Inciso wasn't in jail for tax fraud. 19 years later, in 1982, when I was a 21-year-old attorney in Washington, D.C., I received an assignment to research the meaning of the legal term enterprise in the RICO statute, which, is, which it means exactly what it sounds like. It's the Federal Racketeering and Organized Crime Statute. And I stumbled upon an appellate opinion titled, United States versus Inciso and read a law case with more interest than ever before and ever since. <laughs> Angelo Inciso, Mrs. Inciso's husband, had indeed been locked away in the federal pen, but not for income tax evasion. Angelo Inciso was a mobster, a thug. He was the mafia boss of a local union, and in the 1950s, Angelo Inciso had engaged in extortion and embezzlement of over $500,000. This is, this is like in the 50s. Think about that. That's a lot of money. Now, that was a ton of money then. Mr. Inciso had been engaged in a racketeering enterprise, and he was convicted under the RICO statute, not under the federal income tax laws. Now, I also learned around that time that Mr. Inciso was a close associate of Tony Big Tuna Accardo, <laughs> the head of organized crime for the, for the whole city of Chicago. Tony Accardo was not in jail. In fact, in 1963, when I was 10, Tony the Tuna and his wife lived just one block away from the Menglers. In other words, I had plenty of reasons to have nightmares at night without <laughs> knowing Mr. Inciso at all. But no nightmares for me. Mr. Ricardo handed out each Halloween trick-or-treater an entire box of Cracker Jack. Now, you, you folks who've been around for a time, think of that. That was a big deal in 1963 to get a whole box of Cracker Jack, and I have, still have a warm spot in my heart for Mrs. Accardo. <laughs> Our neighbors also included Paul the Waiter Rica and Sam the Cigar Gincana, who was gunned down in his basement in 1975 while cooking Italian sausage and peppers. Another neighbor was Jackie the Lackey Cerrone, whose son Tom took my older sister Mary Ellen to her first dance in eighth grade. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. Did the Chicago Mafia run out of sunglasses? <laughs> by, these, by, the, by, by the way, these neighbors of ours, the Accardos, the Ricas, the Gincanas, and Cerrones were all Catholic too, and hardworking. I wondered if you were going to get that. 
I leave you with three questions to keep you amused, should the rest of my lecture be not as scintillating as my first remarks. First question, what kind of man is your president, and why didn't the Board of Trustees do a better background check on me? <laughs> Second question, what was Angelo Inciso's nickname? Third question, what was my nickname when I was growing up in that mafia-infested neighborhood? But enough about me and my shady background. Tonight I want to convey to you to underscore the importance of thinking about St. Mary's University's faith mission as fundamentally an enterprise. Enterprise, we know, can also, this is the third meaning, signify purposeful, organized, systematic activity. And I'll have a lot more to say about how the Catholic University is and should be an enterprise of faith, but let me simply assert for now that if St. Mary's is to fulfill its mission as a Catholic Marianist University, we need to view all of our many activities and services, academic and non-academic, as an integrated, purposeful whole. Living our Catholic Marianist mission must involve purposeful, organized, systematic activity. In this term, the Catholic Marianist University should be an enterprise. It's exactly the right word for what we need to talk about. It should be an enterprise centered on the formation and faith of young men and women becoming extraordinary leaders whose lives, personal and professional, are about serving God by serving neighbor. And the rest of my talk will be about that. Now, as part of my contribution to St. Mary's University's lecture series on Catholic intellectual tradition, tonight I intend to really achieve, uh, I've actually achieved my first goal, two other goals. First, I will identify what I consider the core themes of Catholic intellectual tradition and why I think they're so key to the Catholic University as a faithful enterprise. To illustrate these themes, I'll be presenting to you a handful of the more than 160 illuminations from our heritage edition of the St. John's Bible. And second, I will highlight some of the ways St. Mary's is advancing these key themes of the tradition. I plan also to mention some steps we will be taking. We already are taking or will be taking in the next decade. So what is Catholic intellectual tradition? The first and most important point is that we're speaking not about the Catholic intellectual tradition, uh, to, we're, as if we're talking about a single unified philosophy, theology, or, or, or theory. That's not what we mean by Catholic intellectual tradition. It's not a single theme or, or theology or philosophy. No, the best way to think about Catholic intellectual tradition is, is that the ongoing engagement of the Catholic Church inspired by the gospel message with the world, our many cultures, over for the past more than 2,000 years. Catholic intellectual tradition began when the first Christians reflected on the gospels and the meaning of the life of Christ, and it continues today. So if you think about, so what does it include? What does Catholic intellectual tradition include? Well, it includes all of the various writings of the popes and the magisterium, but it also, it also includes the writings of centuries of uh, Catholic and Christian theologians and philosophers, but not just theologians and philosophers. The tradition also embraces men and women from every discipline, profession, and field of study, and I think you'll see why as we walk through this. Every field, science, literature, art, music, theater, men and women seeking truth and in interpreting or illuminating or applying the gospel message to the most uh, pressing uh, social, political, theological, uh, cultural issues. Men and women, so they, I mean, you could name, you, we could just start talking and name names Michelangelo, uh, St. Augustine, Dorothy Day, uh, Thomas Aquinas, Bernard Lonergan, J.R.R. Tolkien. Flannery O'Connor, Blessed Chaminade, Dante, St. Teresa of Avila, Mother Teresa, uh, uh, our soon Dayton Professor Miguel Diaz will be here. He's contributing to Catholic intellectual tradition, Sister Helen Prejean of Dead Man Walking, Pope Francis. So the many voices in, in, in the tradition are distinct and they span uh, the centuries. If you think about the names I've mentioned, they're, they're all different. That said, there are nevertheless some common or core themes that describe our uniquely Catholic vision. And, and uh, let me just say that, you know, that I did some work on it and there's no general agreement about what those themes are. Uh, I came upon um, 
one document that talked about 10 common themes. Uh, Dayton University actually has 14. Uh, you'll be happy to hear I only have four. And here they are. Uh, first, a sacred integrated vision of truth. Second, faith in reason is going to be is both key to that search for truth. Uh, third, the word made flesh. Fourth, the dignity and relational nature of the human person. Let's start with then uh, the first. Catholic intellectual tradition sees the universe as God's creation and as a gift of God. Everything, everyone begins because of God's loving grace and presence. In creation, we can see in our search for truth, not only an ultimate purpose and meaning, but God's goodness and beauty too. This is really one of the first illuminations in the St. John's Bible. Uh, we're presented with Genesis' first creation story in chapter 1. Uh, first of all, note the seven panels for the seven days. Gold, which represents the divine presence throughout the Bible, appears as a thin line even during the first day of the formless void. And God is present in every panel throughout creation. So a number of points you could make just from looking at this. Since God is present in and throughout the world, there's a sacred dimension to nature, a sacred dimension to all things and all peoples. All genuine searches for truth, whether we're talking about the sciences, through art, music, literature, as well uh, can lead us incrementally to truth, goodness, and beauty. So the Catholic intellectual view of the universe presupposes an underlying unity also among the various disciplines. The tradition presupposes that each discipline can contribute to a larger understanding of the nature of things and of God's role. In, in this illumination, for example, we see the harmony of religion and science, the ancient and the modern. Panel three, the separation of the earth from the seas is made from satellite photos of the Ganges Delta. And consider this, just think about the symbolism here. Donald Jackson, the artistic director of the St. John's Project, chose the Ganges River, the most sacred river of the Hindus, for his third panel. The Catholic intellectual tradition, at its finest, is not always at its finest, but at its finest, draws upon the learning not only of Catholic and Christian scholars, writers, artists, musicians, but of other religious traditions, of other cultures, and the secular world. And that's why most Catholic universities, quite frankly, are like ours. They are, they are as welcoming to non-Catholics as to Catholics. And, 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 and you see it here. The most prominent example of this drawing on, on other traditions took place in Paris in the 13th century. Uh, the great Dominican Thomas Aquinas, an author of Summa Theologica, drew substantially on the works of the Greek pagan philosopher Aristotle, the Jewish thinker Maimonides, and the Muslims of Averroes and Avicenna. By the way, Pope Francis recently made this point that God has no boundaries. God has no limitations in his love and grace. He was doing, you know, he's done four interviews in very unusual circumstances, the first one on a plane. Uh, this one was to the atheist editor of an Italian newspaper, and Francis said to the editor, and I believe in God. Not in a Catholic God, there is no Catholic God. There is God, and I believe in Jesus Christ, his incarnation. Jesus is my teacher and my pastor, but God the Father, Abba, is the light and the creator. This is my being. Do you think we're very far apart? Panel four, God's creation on the fourth day of the sun and the stars in the sky also underscores that our tradition embraces integration of the many fields of human inquiry. In this case, again, science and religion. Panel four is an image taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. And in panel six, we see the creation of man and woman. And these men and women look nothing like the Adam and Eve I remember from third grade. They don't bear the slightest resemblance to Hugh Jackman or Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> Donald Jackson uses images from aboriginal paint, rock paintings in Australia. In the second creation story, Genesis 2, we see that St. John's Bible's illumination makes a more explicit connection between the religion of scriptures and modern science. Adam and Eve, again, uh, neither blonde-haired nor blue-eyed, uh, 
are inspired by photographs of the Karo tribe of the Omo River in southwest Ethiopia, which reflects the most current theories that humans evolved from our predecessors in the heart of Africa. In sum, Catholic intellectual tradition holds that all searches for truth, whether conducted in the laboratory, in a library, an art studio, or a chapel, are ultimately one. As our colleague Professor Glenn Hughes has argued in his book Transcendence in History, all human seeking, all human learning, yearning for understanding is ultimately a search for meaning and purpose, a search for the design, uh, for, for the divine, a search for transcendence. So what does a, this kind of vision, a sacred integrated vision of truth, tell us about the nature of a great Catholic university? Well, as others have said before, I believe it begins with the kind of liberal arts education St. Mary's has provided for decades along with the kind of core curriculum we require of all of our undergraduate students, integrated and interdisciplinary. Again, in the words of our own Professor Hughes, Catholic universities exist to promote the exploration openly and vigorously of all the things that are. Our faculty and staff are here literally to open the minds of you, our students, to open your minds about nature, about human achievement and human failure, about virtue and vice, and ultimately about God. So if one goal of a Catholic university is to open our students' minds to all that is it, all that, all the things that are, then, then it is no surprise that almost every Catholic university like St. Mary's has a core curriculum that is about the liberal arts. The second theme is faith and reason is both key to the search for truth. Our dominant secular culture, on the one hand, rejects as irrelevant what cannot be verified. On the other hand, we have fundamental religions which embrace only faith, organized religions that place little or no value on reasoned understanding. A second theme of the tradition here it rejects them both. For many years now, I've viewed this second theme as really one of Catholicism's most profound insights, and quite frankly, that's why I'm Catholic. Human beings made in the image of God have the intellectual capacity to discern truth, meaning, and purpose, and they thereby come closer to God using what God has given us. Isn't that a wonderful, isn't that a wonderful thought? Um, faith and reason are not at war with each other. If we open our spirits, they can work together to bring us closer to understanding God's individual call to each of us. Yet reason alone we know is not enough. While our reasoning powers can open windows to the divine, God's being, God's grace and providence are mysteries. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians, quote, for now we see through a glass darkly. And my own sinfulness and weakness drag me away from God's purposes for me. Look again at the illumination of the second creation story. On the left, creation is colorful, abundant, fertile, beautiful. But after the fall, even, even actually before the fall, but after the fall, the world's also dangerous, dazzling and alluring, but distracting. Note the colorful coral snake surrounding Eve. Both Adam and Eve have painted faces. Adam presents a haunting appearance in dark shadow. Eve smiles or laughs or taunts or mocks or teases. Which, and which is it? Is it all of those things? In vibrant orange and yellow. No, reason is necessary, right, but not sufficient. To move closer to God, prayer and faith, God's grace are required. So Catholic intellectual tradition, therefore, rejects, it's always good to quote Mark Twain, Mark Twain's quip, faith is believing what you know ain't so. <laughs> Similarly, the tradition does not accept George Bernard Shaw's harumph that the idea of a Catholic university is, quote, a contradiction in terms. Uh, I would have said an oxymoron, that's more elegant, more, more poetic, I think. For myself, when I was the age of most of our students here tonight, my 20s, this tenet of our Catholic faith was the most difficult for me, both to grasp and to accept. I, I, was, well, I was like Mark, well, I wasn't really like Mark Twain, but I, I, I had the view of Mark Twain and the view of Shaw in our secular society. I wanted to believe only that which I could prove for myself. Over the years, I think I've grown beyond those uh, wild, reckless days. Uh, I don't seem so reckless anymore, do I? I've become grateful for all my blessings, 
And the older I get, the more I realize that almost every important decision in life, all the important choices we make involve a mix of reason, empirical data, rational justification on the one hand, but on the other hand, a heavy dose of hope and trust and faith. My reliance on my loving wife, Mona, uh, my children, one of whom is here, Michael, my friends, my colleagues, is, is rational, to be sure. I have plenty of reasons to trust Mona, don't you know? I have plenty of justification to rely on my team of good colleagues, but reliance on, on people also involves a commitment of the heart. And so in my gray-haired, uh, I wish I had more, bald-headed days, I've come to appreciate that the integrative process of faith and reason and the search for meaning is really not significantly different than the processes we employ in our daily lives. The process of, of inquiry and judgment and insight into the tangible and the intangible are not so different. In effect, God's loving gift to me of faith and my rational talents are gifts that I use every day of my life. They reinforce, they define who I am, they make me more human. So how does a Catholic Un Marianist University help our students develop their abilities to reason, to grow in their faith, and to rely on both? Here too we get, begin, I think, with our core curriculum and its breadth, which in our small class settings also facilitate the development of all the skills that are important, analytical, critical thinking, our, their or, our oral and uh, written communication skills, the self-understanding, that joy of discovery, the need throughout our lives for questioning, for pondering, for doubting. As, as painful, I'm thinking more about my brother was a kind of a pain in the act, as painful as the mantra question authority was for my parents, I was not the problem. Uh, it's how we grow and mature. Many of you have heard me comment on the importance of helping our students develop these reasoning and communication skills, as well as other professional skills, not only for the personal growth that I've been talking about, for your spiritual growth, but for professional development. What a wonderful coincidence, right? That all of the things that we teach at St. Mary's about how you can come to uh, uh, develop meaning and purpose in your lives, all those skills and values also will help you professionally. They're about they're about, about, they're about skills of, uh, that people need in interacting and the values that, that, you, that you need to come closer to God are also the values of the great professional. So there's yet another role for reason for critical thinking at a Catholic Marianist University. It's often been said that the Catholic Church does its best thinking at Catholic universities. The great philosophers and theologians of the church, I mentioned uh, Aquinas earlier, you could, you could mention Bernard Lonergan, Alistair McIntyre, any, you know, hundreds or thousands of them. Most of the great Catholic theologians and philosophers did their work here. At, some of them did their work here, uh, some of them are doing their work here, but they did their work at, at Catholic universities. And at, uh, 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 seeking to interpret and, and apply Christ's message to our culture, and the social justice and economic issues of the day. Every position is to be entertained and weighed in the search for truth. You get that from the, you certainly got that from the first uh, slide. Maybe not the first slide, that was, uh, that was Mr. Inciso. <laughs> uh, the faith lives too, for our, of our, the faith lives too of our students, faculty and staff are enhanced in a number of ways. University ministry promotes and supports the prayer and worship not only of Catholics, but, is non, but of non-Catholics as well, uh, members of other traditions. Uh, and student development, uh, presence in the residence hall, and university min ministry's presence in the rev, uh, residence halls are so key to, to that formation that is important for the, our young adults. There are many other ways, actions, for example, in, in, with, and for our communities, in which God's grace and God's blessing become more vibrant. Uh, most significant, certainly this is uh, our, our Marianist charism, to becoming more human is community, living in community. So that living in residence in college is key, serving and embracing community, and ultimately transforming community. The third theme uh, is the word made flesh. About 10 years ago, at my last place of employment, I sat in a room full with faculty and staff listening to a talk about Catholic intellectual tradition. And not once 
in explaining Catholic intellectual tradition did the speaker expressly mention Jesus Christ. It struck me as an oversight. Uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which is beautiful in so many ways, in paragraph 65 emphatically corrects this oversight in powerful terms. Christ, the Son of God made man, is the Father's only perfect and unsurpassable word. In him God has said everything. There will be no other word than this one. Uh, so this wondrous illumination of the word made flesh uh, comes at the beginning of the gospel, according to John, full of gold, right? Pope Francis, in his exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, in English it's called the joy of, uh, translated the joy of the gospel, has reminded us to focus on the core of our Christian faith and not to be unduly consumed by, quote, those secondary aspects, which, important as they are, do not in and of themselves convey the heart of Christ's message. What shines forth, Francis says, is the beauty of the saving love of God made manifest in Jesus Christ, who died and rose from the dead. Francis further explains, what counts above all else is faith working through love, and the greatest of all the virtues is mercy. Uh, St. John's Bible beautifully presents what Pope Francis describes as the core of our faith, uh, in the illumination of Matthew chapter 5 of the sermon, this is the Beatitudes. Uh, poor, though, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. The fourth and final core theme of Catholic intellectual tradition, the dignity and relational nature of the human person, in a few words captures the gist of the Beatitudes as well as the meaning, the revelation of Jesus Christ as God and human. In paging through the St. John's Bible, you might, we might say, how do we see Jesus? Uh, not, of course, as an earthly king, or, but, but as a son of a carpenter and humble teenage girl, a guy who hung with the poor and vulnerable, right, with the lepers, with the outcasts, with the despised, with the untouchables. Note this illumination in two frames from John chapter 7 and 8, the woman caught in adultery. In the top frame, a temple official literally holds the, bio, the Hebrew word for adultery in his right hand. Uh, sadly, the law appears as a weapon, as much a weapon as the stone in his left hand. The word adultery extends beyond the frame, beyond the panel, and hence beyond the immediate scene to us to implicate you and me in unforgiving judgment. To his left, a second temple official even more stands scrutinizing you and me. He's focused unsympathetically on you and me. Well, at least on you, because I'm not looking over there. Uh, and the woman's expression and hands communicate, of course, fear, anxiety, and despair in the top panel. I'm sorry, I went, uh, but in the bottom frame, but in the bottom frame, the woman's face is filled with repentance and gratitude. She's veiled. Jesus has opened the curtain for her, for anyone to enter. But God's mercy has expectations. What happened here? Did I? Okay. Um, there's no handout here. Jesus, there's no handout. Oh, not, I don't have a handout either. <laughs> all I got is slides. Jesus' mercy, like uh, Catholic Relief Services partnerships around the world, is empowering. His respect for the adulteress's dignity as a human person leads him to invite her to proceed into the gold hallway. Right? Here's, the, here's the color gold again, which signifies the divine. But she's to sin no more. She's commanded to follow him and to begin her journey to a life well lived. And then the last illumination is from Mark, the parable of the sower and the seed. Jesus wearing Wrangler blue jeans and a Kmart work shirt is the sower. And because he sows the word, uh, Jesus is also the seed. He's both the sower and the seed. And note the seeds also extend beyond the panel. In fact, in the St. John's Bible version, which you can see, so I guess the Gospels is over here, after the lecture, some of them actually land on a few of the apostles' names in the adjoining texts. So the apostles are also sowers, 
they are also called to evangelize. And since the seeds again extend outside the boundaries of the panel, it's on us too. We're sowers of the seed as well. To be fully human, the parable of the sower and the seed tells us, is to extend our love and kindness to others. So Jesus, this is Francis in the uh, apostolic exhortation. Jesus is the first and greatest evangelizer. And Pope Francis also said, Mary is the mother of the church, she of the unqualified, yes, Lord. And without her, we could never truly understand the spirit of the new evangelization. So Pope Francis, despite suggestions to the contrary, is a Marianist. So we too are called, right? We too are called, faculty who are here, staff and students, to partner with Jesus and with our mother Mary, to participate together in this new evangelization, to be missionaries. Shamanad said the same, right? The word, our work is sublime, it is magnificent, it is because we are missionaries of Mary who has, who has told us to do whatever he tells you. Yes, we are missionaries because to each one, the Blessed Virgin has delivered a mandate to work at the salvation of our brethren. So what does all this mean for St. Mary's University? What should this mean for those of us faculty, staff, and trustees who are engaged in and passionate about St. Mary's University? I think there are, I think it should require us to revitalize and to expand on three elements of what makes a great Catholic university uh, greatly Catholic. What allows a great Marianist university following in the footsteps of Chaminade to continue our missionary work. First, I believe it should lead us to promote the understanding and engagement with Catholic intellectual tradition, not only with the, within the fences of St. Mary's, but outside into the community of the archdiocese and beyond. Already, as most of you know, St. Mary's has been actively involved in this project. This four-time four, four uh, four annual lecture series on Catholic intellectual tradition, uh, led by, uh, where are you, Father Rudy? Led by Father Rudy Vela, is a cornerstone. The St. Mary's core curriculum engages Catholic intellectual tradition, too, under the leadership of Professor Megan Mustaine. Megan, you want to? It in, the St. Mary's Corps engages all of our undergraduate students over the course of their studies in those questions which are at the core of our tradition. Who are we as human beings? Why are we here? The Corps focuses students on their own self-identities, what it means to be fully human, and it therefore also introduces our students to separate courses on human person's relationship to God, to nature, to neighbor, and to the wider social order. So there's abundant evidence that the tradition is already alive and present here at St. Mary's. Uh, I'm delighted that we have taken additional steps. Some examples. Last year, Ed Speed, one of our trustees, and his wife, Linda, established two separate endowments to support faculty research. One provides support uh, specifically for theology and philosophy faculty. A second endowment supports humanities and social sciences faculty from the School of Humanities and Social Sciences here who produce scholarship on issues of peace and social justice. Both endowments will empower our St. Mary's faculty to uh, undertake the kind of research agenda that we're talking about here. So Ed uh, Speed, will you, I'm not gonna ask you to stand, but Ed Speed is with us today. Would, would you, yeah. Another new initiative, obviously, is the heritage edition of the St. John's of Bible, a generous gift of uh, friends of Mona and mine in Minnesota. Uh, we've acquired, uh, you've got two volumes here, this magnificent seven-volume edition of the St. John's Bible. But the heritage edition is not just a set of seven pretty volumes that we're going to store in the special, hide away in the special collections uh, room, no offense, uh, uh, Caroline Bird, we're, we're, we're not going to hide it away. They're here to inspire St. Mary's and the broader community. And to further this effort, Ruben Escobedo 
A trustee and his wife, Veronica, have established with a generous gift of $500,000 the Reuben and Veronica Escobedo St. John's Bible Scripture Series and Interdisciplinary Lecture Series. Reuben and Veronica, <laughs> thank you. And already under the leadership of uh, uh, Professor Bob O'Connor, where are you, Bob? Yeah. Uh, the, the director of the St. John's Bible Project, uh, we've taken the Bible into the community of San Antonio, and in two weeks we're going to be, uh, Dr. Bob, too, will be in Houston with the Houston Alumni Association. So it's a, it's a, traveling, uh, it's a traveling show as it should be. It's not simply about the books, it's about, it's about the discussion and the, and, and, the, and the inspiration that can come from it. And recently, we've launched an exciting religious art project inspired by our own art professor and 2012 San Antonio of the Year artist, Brian St. John. Brian, are you here? No, I didn't see him. Um, an art auction, uh, which, is, which is under the leadership of uh, Lionel and Kathy Sosa, will take place in October at Mona and My House. And it really is inspired by uh, the St. John's Bible. The eight to 12, maybe more prominent local artists, including the Sosas, including Brian St. John, will be uh, il illustrate, illuminating, creating works of art uh, based on a line of scripture. And the, 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 line, the line of scripture that, uh, is, that uh, the group is selecting for this October auction is Let There Be Light. And I'm, uh, there will also be, uh, High school students and high school teachers and students from St. Mary's involved as well. And, and I do have to get away from the mark here. This is, uh, this is a work, new work by Brian uh, illuminating his interpretation of Let There Be Light. I welcome you uh, to the podium after the lecture. You know, finally, and still on the horizon, will be the establishment of a Southwest Center for Catholic Studies. Uh, the center will expand the efforts I've just discussed. It'll be interdisciplinary. We will draw on faculty from all the schools and disciplines here. And we're going to be raising money to recruit faculty, to be able to recruit faculty from other institutions. We're going to start poaching on the likes of Notre Dame and Boston College and even Dayton. Through outreach, uh, through outreach, the center will also, again, act outside the fences and bring, uh, bring Catholic studies to this community and beyond. Uh, eventually, we also hope as we hire up uh, to develop a major in Catholic studies and perhaps a graduate degree program. And then the center, which will be, is a multi-million dollar project, uh, ultimately will be housed in, our, in, the, in the spiritual center of this university, our, our spiritual core, the heart and soul of St. Mary's, Reinbold Hall. That itself will involve some fundraising. We're going to renovate and remodel this great historic building in the same way that we've done for St. Saint, Saint, uh, Saint Louis Hall. So just as vital, a second goal in the coming years must be to expand our efforts outside the classroom, to touch the hearts and spirits of our undergraduate students, but also of our graduate and professional students. As Shamanad said, religion's not taught, it's communicated. Religion is instilled more deeply in the spirits and hearts of the students through the atmosphere that permeates the school rather than through teaching. It's the gesture, the look. In the, in, so, so what are some of the things we're doing? Well, some of what we've been doing, we're just going to continue. We are, remain fully committed to all the great work of the, of the Center for Civic Engagement and its outreach into the community. All of those involved, would you raise your hands? I know Amy and Rebecca, thank you for your work. The, the point I want to make about the center, which has been true to our, really to our identify, the St. The Mary, Mary's community extends itself not because out, outside these fences, not because of some vague sense that service is an obligation of good citizenship. It's not like paying your taxes or driving within the speed limit, which not too many people do in San Antonio, I've noticed. No, it's, 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 it's about essentially the words that we find in Micah. Uh, he has told you, O mortal, what is good. 
What, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God? Well, what more can we do? Well, we are, uh, on Friday, a group of us, uh, Brian Buck, Buckmeyer, who, uh, who oversees our Marianist Leadership Program, and uh, Brother Jose, who is in charge of our residence hall ministry, are going to drive to Houston and meet with a foundation for the purpose of expanding both programs. Uh, we're going to offer the foundation trustees a deal they can't refuse. <laughs> An advocacy style I picked up in my Chicago neighborhood from... <laughs> Thank you, Tony Big Tuna Accardo. <laughs> Let me conclude. I see Father Rudy was wandering around back there, watching the clock. <laughs> Hiring to mission is key to our going forward. And hiring, our mission is not like a dinner at Luby's cafeteria, right? You can't just, um, you just can't sign on to St. Mary's solely to dine on the green jello and the chocolate cream pie. Our mission is an integrated, holistic commitment. And as you, I won't read the mission statement to you. It's about, as you know, forming people in faith and educating leaders for the common good through community. So if we're truly serious about mission, we need to hire faculty and staff who are, continue to hire faculty and staff who are committed to the whole mission, to, to all of it. Uh, men and women of faith, not just Catholics, not just Christians, who by their words, deeds, and examples touch the hearts and minds and spirits of our students. And more is required, right? We also need to, uh, I was given about 30 books, I think, on Marianist charism when I arrived. Ongoing formation of faculty and staff is also critical as we go forward. Uh, we can't do it unless we, uh, we can't honestly represent that we are a fine Catholic Marianist University unless our faculty and staff are educated in what it means to, what the Catholic intellectual tradition is about and what, what it is to, be, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, promote the Marianist charism. And I'm delighted to announce that in December we received a significant gift of $1.5 million to enhance the formation of our faculty and Catholic intellectual tradition, particularly through the lens and wisdom of arguably the most important American Catholic theologian of our time, uh, Father Bernard Lonergan. This endowment will establish the St. Mary's University Distinguished Chair in Catholic Philosophy. And one of the significant roles of this chairholder will be to conduct workshops and seminars for faculty in all of the disciplines, in science, in business, in law, as well as in humanities and social sciences. I want to credit, where are you, Father Shorp? I want to credit Father Franz Shorp for, uh, for the inspiration of that idea, and of course for, uh, for his brother and sister-in-law. So Father, you're, you're the inspiration, and you should take credit. Well, I've spoken for a long time. I, I think I've got about 30 seconds, but I'm going to take a mi minute. There are other points I would have liked to have made. I would have liked to speak longer about a service and civic engagement. I would have liked to talk longer about how important community is to informing uh, our lives, informing our, our purposes. I would have liked to build even more on Pope Francis's exhortation, especially his caustic critique that there are, quote, Christians whose lives seem more like Lent without Easter. <laughs> How terrible, huh? Think about it. Pope Francis gets it, right? St. Mary should always be joyful, laughing, a spirited place to study and work and to worship. So it, it, we, we, we should be joyful, we should be laughing. So it's time for me to conclude, and let me end by simply pointing out that you and I are on a holy, sacred mission. St. Mary's University should never be simply another fine regional university that provides knowledge and training to young adults. St. Mary's is a gateway, a faithful enterprise, and we are all missionaries. As missionaries of higher education, we are embarked on the holy task of forming faithful young men and women to become extraordinary leaders, men and women whose lives, personal and professional, are about serving God, 
by serving my uh, neighbor. So thank you for your consideration, and God bless you. I am indeed very proud at this point to uh, thank President Mingler. He worked, as I mentioned at the beginning, long and hard. Uh, I don't think any one of our CIT, this is the 11th annual uh, CIT, Catholic Intellectual <laughs> Tradition Lecture Series, but I don't think any one of our lecturers has received a standing ovation. Okay, so congratulations, Tom. Sterling job. I'm mindful that I have a little leverage here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you've already been introduced to some of our key, before we open it up to questions, and as uh, the tradition has been, we always give the floor to students first, and this is the way President Mingler would want it. So students, you all know the rules. If you're going to ask a question, you have to come up over here, give us your name and uh, your area of discipline, and uh, you have to speak to the mic because this is being recorded which leads me to say that the recording will probably be put on iTunes within the week or two. Uh, I will get uh, the script that uh, President Mingler has developed, and as soon as we get it ready, it will be available so you can contact the Office of Mission and uh, or the Rector's Office, and we will get that to you if you request it. So again, uh, students, if you have a question, please come forward. silenced. <laughs> I think they're afraid of you, Tom. <laughs> no student, okay? This is one of our perennial students. I should, let me just say, I, when, I was a, when I first became a dean at St. Thomas, there was a, one of my students was running for student class president, and uh, her, uh, she said she was going to, her, her, I'm looking at all these students over here, there, she, uh, her, uh, her campaign pledge that was, she was going to stand up to the scary, frightening dean, which I, I, I brought one of them into class with me one day and called on her. No, I wanted to say, Tom, that you have really given a good explanation of university. The complex of creation is not single. It is so complex. We couldn't have enough departments here <laughs> to cover everything. Right. But you did a very excellent job of showing that truth is many-sided, and we have to work at spreading it. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Brother Bill. Thank you. Open to the floor. Anyone wish to speak? Again, please give us your name and uh, come forward. Where's the camera? Okay. Uh, <laughs> you said I was supposed to look at the camera. Uh, I'm Tony Blasi. Uh, just a lonely adjunct in my retirement uh, with sociology. Uh, but I'm the son of a space scientist. And so my question pertains to the natural sciences, which I am not uh, a specialist in. Uh, but my father would, um, by day, design satellites. By night, he would pray his rosary. And, and there was no contradiction between them. Uh, is it possible in our Texas environment, without reinventing Deschardins' wheel, of addressing the whole question of evolution from a Catholic perspective? Well, I think that I, I, I'm really on dangerous ground here. Uh, 
I might call on a theologian here. But I, I think the Catholic Church is, uh, uh, says that its theology is fully consistent with uh, evolution. Indeed, that's, uh, that's the point of both uh, the first creation, the illumination of the first creation story, and the second creation story. So beautifully illuminated. Uh, couldn't, I couldn't speak about it better than what we saw in the first and second illumination. And so I think, you know, that, that very, the very key. We, lose our, we use our heads as well as our hearts, and that's uh, the, the, that's the mo- as I said, that's the most Im- profound, uh, in my view, the most profound uh, doctrine uh, th- uh, of the Catholic Church, and quite frankly, why I am Catholic. We have uh, Bob O'Connor. That will step forward. Oh. I probably don't need a mic. Yes, you do. No, you do. For the, ta- For the tape purposes, you do, Bob. Are we sure we want to tape them? <laughs> well, there's, there's that. <laughs> uh, I'm Bob O'Connor, and I uh, try to teach theology. Um, <laughs> Because I'm the director of the St. John's Bible Project, I'd be interested, Tom, by the way, I'm the only one in this room who can claim, truthfully, to have gone to school with Jackie Cerrone's son. (laughs) Jackie Cerrone was one of the mugshots in the earlier part of the, and I did go to school with him. He controlled all the milk in... (laughs) In San in uh, in Chicago, Bob knows exactly what my background Absolutely. is. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah. and I'm proud to say that Tom is a Sox fan, <laughs> not an ersatz Chicago person, a Cub fan. I'm I'm curious in preparing for this the Catholic intellectual tradition, et cetera, what you found out of the St. John's Bible, what you discovered, what was the experience of looking at these illuminations. What did they bring to you? Kind of a visio divina instead of a lexio divina. Hmm. Well, uh, I guess I, uh, uh, I could say, I think truthfully, that uh, the visio divina is part, uh, y- you feel it, you don't necessarily know how to express it. So I could simply stop there, right? Uh, I think that's part of it, and I say it with all seriousness. I, I, I would tend to focus on just some of the... I, I found the, the, uh, uh, the two-paneled uh, woman of adultery to be profound. I mean, just so beautiful and, and, the, and expresses so much the, the, the hand of the temple official outside the panel you know, saying you are all bad too, and you're all, and and then the the, the second panel, with um, the the how it touches you when you see there's the there's the Christ who is both very merciful and forgiving. I'd say giving the woman a second chance, but you know, but sin no more. And that's those are there's so many lessons just in that image that uh, that I would say how many times I've heard that parable or read it in church and mass and it never it didn't hit me didn't mean as much as when I was quite frankly looking around for illuminations that would uh, talk most poignantly about what uh, what it is to um, what it is to re- truly respect the dignity of each individual, which, I, which was the point I was trying to illustrate. Again, thank you. Thank you.